So looks like we're recording. So anyway, thank you very much indeed for all of you joining us. And this is uh, a lunch and learn that we have been preparing for for quite some time. So I'm absolutely delighted that you all are able to join us. And I'm assuming, we all are assuming that uh, most of you are either thinking or contemplating. Maybe you've already started your odyssey or maybe you are in the midst of uh, your, your journey or your odyssey. And if you haven't discovered it, there be dragons uh, <laughs> between now and uh, your liquidity event. So it just occurred to me that today might not be a bad idea if we brought uh, for you uh, a team of who I highly, highly respect of colleagues with whom I've worked for a very, very long time. They are founders, they are senior executives, they are angel and VC investors. They have a lot of lessons to share. They've discovered them in pretty much the similar way that, that you both are or will be, and they have plenty of insights. And so I, I know that they will have a lot of valuable lessons for us to learn about today. So I thought I'd uh, give a little bit of an introduction to who we are. And we are the Office of Technology Partnerships. And we facilitate the development and commercialization of ideas emanating from both UC Riverside and you for the benefit of society. And we report to the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development. And our, our role generally is, is threefold and that's technology commercialization, corporate and strategic partnerships and innovation and entrepreneurship. And our mission is to catalyze the translation of research and development discoveries from both university research and the private sector. We also provide opportunities for faculty, students, and all of you to explore and flourish with your entrepreneurial endeavors and so forth. Dr. Rosabel Ochoa, our Associate Vice Chancellor, is our leader and, and visionary, and we love her to death. And uh, we are extremely excited with everything that she, we're doing, and we're uh, ecstatic about being members of her team. David, I don't know whether you are a, have been able to join us or not, but uh, if you are here, now, please feel free to say hi, but otherwise, let me just brag about you a little bit as being our managing director of entrepreneurial programs and also the multidisciplinary research building on campus here. It's a four story, 125,000 square foot structure on campus, providing offices, labs and support space for faculty research and other ventures as well. So welcome there. And Misty and Scott, I'm gonna introduce you just a little bit later in some ensuing slides, so stay tuned. But I wanted to say hi to also Jennifer and, and Alexandra Orozco. And Jennifer, if, uh, could I impose on you maybe to, for just a couple of minutes, no more to tell us about yourself just a tad and the uh, all about the Excite Startup Incubator. Would that be okay? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Martin. My name is Jennifer Etralde. I am the Excite Startup Incubator Manager, and I also uh, do associate, I'm the Associate Director of Outreach and uh, Community Engagement for the Office of Technology Partnerships. Uh, our Excite Incubator uh, was created by a partnership with the County of Riverside, the City of Riverside, and UC Riverside that showcased is the region's commitment to support entrepreneurs and grow local startups here. Uh, we have a facility in downtown Riverside where uh, we have over 30 startups right now working on their um, their products and their, their technology and really working to move their companies forward. Uh, it has co-working space, office space, and then we um, have programming that is uh, in partnership with um, the EPIC SBDC program, which is um, directed by Scott Brodsky, which uh, who you'll hear from later. But um, we really support uh, startups with resources, uh, with the facility, and um, having access to our network so that startups are able to grow and uh, launch their businesses here in the region. Um, 
We also um, just launched a milestone-based program to help startups to be able to uh, move to that next phase. So uh, if you have any questions or would like to uh, learn more about our incubator uh, here in Riverside, uh, feel free to email me. I will be putting my in contact information below. Thanks so much. Terrific. Jennifer, thank you very much indeed. And Alex, I uh, am, am grateful that you're here to meet us as well. It's been a great honor to work with you and be a colleague. And I thought it'd be a great idea if I can impose on you to uh, maybe introduce yourself for just a couple of moments and tell us about the International Partnership Program. Thank you, Martin, and welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Alexandra Orozco, and I lead the international programs for our office. And what that really means is that I go internationally, especially Latin America, and do a lot of the work that we do here, which is helping entrepreneurs bring their technologies to market. And I specifically scout or look for technologies that are interested in being incubated uh, in Riverside, and they want to access the US market uh, with our help, and then we bring them here, help them get established so that we can continue to grow here, the Inland Empire, and all of our team that's present here today, it's uh, part of the mentor team and the support team to help all these international technologies um, come to Riverside and help us grow the economy here. That's what I do, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much indeed, Alex. Much appreciated. So um, I wanted to introduce all of you to our panel who are joining us. Now, Ken, unfortunately, for family reasons, cannot join us. But uh, Jim, his collaborator with Strategic Partnerships, will fill in terrifically and represent both Ken and Jim. But uh, Art, uh, have you been able to join us yet? Not yet. So let's move on to Doug. Hey, Doug, welcome. And uh, could I uh, ask you to spend a couple of moments to introduce yourself? And, um, and, sure. And yeah, let us know uh, why we're such a genius in having, by the way, all of you uh, be part of the part of our panel today. Well, I think genius might stretch it a little bit, Martin, but thank you. Um, so Doug Colmeyer, I um, work for Roosevelt in the Office of Technical Partnerships. I wear several hats. I work with uh, work with CSPC clients, helping them commercialize their new startups. I also work with uh, o Oasis and Scene and Tacy's, and I think we use a lot of these uh, abbreviations. And I'm not going to go into everything, but my main hat is um, Scene, the Southern California Energy Innovation Network, uh, that tries to attract clean tech startups to the Inland Empire, and that's my focus is is trying to get uh, education, the government agencies and private enterprise to collaborate to attract uh, new new clean tech startups. So Martin, thank you for inviting me today. And um, that's really, uh, really excited to have you. Would Could I impose on you to tell us what Oasis means, however? Um, <laughs> so yeah. Oasis yeah. is, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the term, but Oasis is essentially uh, an opportunity to open a, an incubator um, here in Riverside that's going to be a focus between uh, the region and UCR and CARB to attract all kinds of um, startups, not only clean tech, but ag tech and med tech, uh, and, and try and again, just increase the um, economic viability of the Inland Empire with higher paying uh, jobs. Doug, thanks very much indeed. Hey, Steve. Hey, Martin. Hey, thanks for including me today. It's exciting to be joining the, all of this, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion. Um, I'm Steve Sharp. Uh, like my colleagues, I'm, a, I'm one of the entrepreneurs in residence at Riverside, UC Riverside. I've been with the program for about five years. Um, I'm involved with our small business development or SBDC clients, uh, working you know, with and through a Scott and team. And then I uh, am involved also with, uh, with our Innovar i program. So some clients there and uh, the, the technologies and industries that uh, that my clients represent are in med tech, ag tech, um, higher tech, electronics, et cetera, which for me is particularly fun because I grew up in manufacturing. I have 40 plus years in manufacturing businesses as an executive, the last better part of the last 15 consulting and uh, working in startups, either as a consultant or as a COO or in a role like that. So I have a bit of background in those areas, but I'm really, you know, ultimately my background is more in manufacturing and operations as well as marketing. 
and a bit of HR background as well. So it's especially fun for me to hear about all these different categories, ones in which I didn't grow up, but uh, ones that I can I can learn from and also try to apply some of the, the know-how from a, from the various places I've been. I've, I've been on Earth quite a long time. Just don't let my pale blonde hair and boyish looks fool you. I'm actually pretty old. Um, but having said that, uh, thoroughly enjoy the process here and I'm excited to be a part of the process today with you. Thanks, Steve, very much indeed. Shomit, have you been able to join us yet? Are you still? No. Okay. Hey, Bill, how are you doing today? And welcome. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for inviting me. And yes, I've known you for about 10 years, and you are a very smart person. Uh, and <laughs> and I you. do enjoy I'll, your I'll send you the five bucks for that. Okay. Five bucks. Okay. I thought it was five, and it'll be fine. So, anyway, uh, happy to be here. My name is Bill Waldo. Uh, I'm a former entrepreneur. Uh, I was in the food industry for more years than I want to have to share, but it was uh, uh, almost 30 years. I uh, sold the company, had to figure out what to do with myself. Uh, I was too young to retire at the time. I don't play golf. So I decided to become an angel investor, which was a real experience. Learned how to lose money quickly. Also learned a lot of valuable lessons. So I've been a part of Pecos Angels, which is currently the probably the second largest angel group in the country, but it's really given me some uh, tremendous experience on the investor side, as well as on the entrepreneur side, in terms of who gets funded, who doesn't, and why. Paralleling that, I've been a part of the SBDC now for 15 years as well. Uh, been part of the uh, UCI. Uh, they've been our host uh, for the past several years. And now I've been invited by uh, my friends at UCR to be, I guess you would call me a, a resource partner to assist clients wherever needed on the whole journey uh, that one has to follow uh, to get prepared to eventually put together an investor presentation and raise capital. So happy to be a part of UCR and uh, happy to be here. And we Thank are you. equally happy to have you with us as well, Bill, and welcome. So uh, Ken unfortunately called me about a half hour ago, family reasons can't make it, but we're going to hit on Jen, uh, Ken rather, uh, later on for other events. So you'll get a great, many great opportunities to meet Ken in the future. So I just thought I'd just flip over and say, hi, Jim, and welcome. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Pleasure to be here with everyone. My name is Jim Yano. And I'm the Associate Director for Corporate Strategic Partnerships here within the Office of Technology Partnerships. So my role allows me to uh, work with the technology commercialization sector, as well as our innovation and entrepreneurs. My role here uh, with the university and within our Office of Technology Partnerships is being that liaison between industry and our researchers and trying to find that fit which uh, will bring together the company needs and what we have here in terms of research. And that's really what we're looking at here with SBIR is determining that fit and, and how to move that along. So as we uh, get further into the discussion, uh, I'll provide certainly more background on that. Uh, previous to joining the university, I uh, worked in agribusiness, pr primarily international business development throughout uh, Asia, Latin America and Europe. So. Uh, that opportunity provided me the uh, uh, experience to uh, share that with the university. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And then that that other fellow up in the upper right corner, that's yours truly here. I'm an economist by trade. And uh, like Bill, I've been a member of the, in the past, a member of the Tech Coast Angels and so forth. Uh, five uh, startup ventures, two liquidity events. And the lion's share of my time is working very closely with Misty Madero, with whom you will meet in just a few moments. And equally an honor to meet with, uh, uh, to work with, that is to say, with Scott Borofsky on uh, capital raising and commercialization and so forth. And also Jay Gilberg with regard to Innovar and, and i as well. So uh, heavy duty on uh, SBIR fundraising, non-dilutive fundraising, uh, venture capital, and commercialization. So uh, that's my story, and I'll, I'll stick with that for the time being. So let's see what's going on here. Hey, Misty, could I impose on you for just a, uh, a moment? Uh, 
tell us sure. a little bit about the resource center. Sure. Um, like I said, I'm Mr. Madero. I'm uh, an industry contract officer at UCR, and I also manage our SBRS teacher resource center. Um, some of the things that our resource center can help you with is um, pretty much anything related to submitting SBIRs, but we specialize in helping you locate funding agencies with a focus on your innovation, helping you understand the programs and requirements. We can connect you and communicate, help you communicate with agency program managers. We can definitely help you connect with our university resources, faculty, students, um, many of our experts. We review and improve proposal drafts. We help you with your commercialization plan and help you find resources for your company and help you build your team. Our resource center um, has a very high success rate compared to the national average overall, which is 18%. We see um, usually about 35%, particularly for our phase one. Um, so if you are needing help with SBARs, please reach out to us because we are um, happy to help. And you know, if the resource center isn't the right fit, we also have partners in many other states that we can help connect you with. Um, there's my email on the screen and I'll put it in the chat. Please feel free to email me for anything about this presentation and anything about the resource center. Thank you. Thanks, Misty. Yeah, and Misty doesn't like to brag about that too much, but um, we've got a mantra uh, relative to that 35% phase one success rate. Uh, and, and that is you can take the pain, torture, and abuse from us, or you can take it from the reviewers. The choice is yours. But we get extremely heavily, closely involved uh, in your commercialization plan and your research design methodology, study approach, and so forth. We may not necessarily have your domain expertise, but we do know the logic and the way of thinking. Uh, of uh, each of the viewers of all of the agencies. Uh, we know the program officers and they know us equally well and they, they join us generally on an annual basis at a convention that we um, uh, put on uh, called uh, SBIR STTR Con. So anyway, um, we're sort of like your helicopter moms in a way in terms of working very, very closely with you. Uh, on preparation and submission of your SBIR phase one and phase twos. So, hey, Scott, um, really Hello. glad. Um, <laughs> uh, could I impose on you to tell us a little bit all the kind of trouble that you've been causing all these years? Yeah, so um, I'll keep it short. I know we want to get to the, the meat of the thing, but basically, yeah. um, uh, so I lead the, the uh, what's called the Epic Small Business Development Center. Um, my background, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done five startups. I also have uh, global uh, executive experience at uh, Fortune 100s like Disney and Marvel. And so um, I started working with uh, Dr. Ochoa about six years ago and this team, and we've uh, worked all worked together to build um, what, what you're seeing here, this amazing team of mentors and experts. Uh, but the coolest thing I think we do is we help startups raise capital because that's one of the main things that startups need, especially... Uh, in our inland Southern California region. And so we have a pipeline process that we do where we do two things. We help bring startups out of the labs at research universities like UCR. And then we also work with community startups that maybe have no connection to a research university. And uh, typically, uh, as you'll learn here, we uh, introduce them to Misty and Martin in the team and they help with SBIR, STTR funding, non-dilutive grant funding. And uh, once they, the startup has hit some milestones and is uh, investable from a angel or venture capital perspective, then uh, I, I and the rest of the team uh, help uh, with that process. So great to be here. And um, we have helped, uh, I actually need to update that stat, but it's uh, about, I think, 38 million now. But in any case, we've helped the startups we mentor raise about 35 plus million dollars uh, over the last few years. And we don't take any equity and we don't charge the startups. We're grant funded. And so we are able to support the founders that we mentor for no cost to the founders. So thanks, Martin. Thank you very much indeed, Scott. And uh, I have not included his picture, that his, his photo, that's an oversight, but uh, there's another very, very important colleague of ours uh, and his name is Jay Gilberg, and I'm, I'm catching you off guard and by surprise, Jay, so I apologize for that. 
but the Innovar i program is something that is uh, a major part of our offering as well. And, and Jay, could I impose on you, if you don't mind, maybe just spend a couple of moments to introduce yourself, even though we can't see your photo or anything. We will when we flip out of these slides, but it would be terrific if you could maybe tell us a little about, about Innovar and us being a, a key element of the Western region, National Science Foundation, i hub. Uh, sure, Martin. Uh... You, everything you said is correct. We are part of the Western Region Hub here at UC Riverside, and what we do is we take a, a university a deep technology, and it's an initial step towards commercialization, and we do that through customer discovery. And I'm fortunate to have many of the uh, people here today who are the instructors and mentors in that program, and we basically uh, handhold these technologies and the people on that team through customer discovery. Uh, they figure out a very short and brief business thesis, identify their customers, what values that our, uh, their technologies have for the customers, and then it becomes an experience to go out and reach them. Uh, so they're doing interviews on Zoom these days and finding out if anyone really cares about their idea and why. So, uh, Anyone who's part of UC Riverside and has deep technology that they'd like to commercialize, we'd love to get you started. And uh, what we do is get you started here and then we send you to the national where it's a little more lucrative. And uh, that's one of the other bigger steps towards uh, getting the kind of uh, capital that, uh, that you are helping with, with uh, SBIR and STTR. Jay, thank you very much indeed and for allowing me to surprise and impose on you. So I, I much appreciate that. So finally, um, here's, here's how we're going to be working today. This is all about you. It's not about us. So uh, this is an informal, I'm going to call it almost close to controlled chaos here. All of us are BFFs today. Um, all of you, I suspect, are either contemplating, have started, or are in the midst of your venture relative to getting non-dilutive SBIR or STTR funds and or equity capital, angel seed, pre-seed, friends and family, venture capital. Uh, we're looking forward to all of your questions. Your questions will take precedence. I typically in these types of programs start off with one or two, but the strategy there or the tactic is, is to get you involved and take over the rest of uh, this lunch and learn. Uh, ask many questions, ask a lot, uh, be free with those. I want you to jump in at all times. And I also want you to contribute. Many of you already have experiences that I think that we could benefit and learn from you as well. So don't be shy, don't hesitate in, in jumping in and giving us your experiences, your take, your insight as well. So with that, let's get this thing rolling. I'm gonna drop out of um, screen sharing. There you are. And the way we're going to do this is that, oh, we've got a ton of chats. That's fantastic. So I'm going to start there um, rather than ask my own questions. And Misty and, and Scott or anybody, could I impose on you to also help me with keeping on tabs of the chat so we don't lose control? Yeah, we're caught up. We're caught up. We're, Martin, we're caught up on the chat. We've been, Misty and I and uh, Jennifer and the team have been putting in uh, answering questions. I think. Uh, oh, fantastic. Do, do, do you want, okay. so you want questions put in the chat or do you want uh, the the startups to unmute and ask the question? Uh, I, 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 either, I, much, either way is fine, but I, my preference is, uh, is just to raise your hand, unmute, and hop in. It, it, it'd be, I think, a lot more productive and enjoyable. Let me get this out of my my face here. Uh, if 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 you just simply jump in and and ask, although Jack, for example, I see that you have um, typed in a question and then just went away from me. 
Here, I'll read, Martin, I'll read it. And then you you want to do that? Uh, yeah, that yeah. That'd be great, yeah. Scott. Okay, yeah. you, you want to do so that Jack, first? Yeah. Yeah, so, Jack, so Jack's saying past experience with one phase one and phase two SBIR in 1990, and current his current project will be a B Corp. He wants to know um, basically what uh, are the options for SBIR opportunities for a, a B Corp, as you know, is, is a, uh, not, not a not 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 typically a very favored uh, corporate type of corporate structure by the venture capital community. But is it something that could raise SBIR funding? I guess would be the question. Um, I yeah. Anybody want to jump in on that, or I, I can certainly. I don't want to dominate the SBIR and STG. Go ahead, dude, go, go ahead, Martin. Yeah. Well, first of all, the uh, the aim is uh, threefold. For SBIRs and STTR, and and uh, the, the first one is to stimulate the economy. Number two is to create jobs, and um, number three is to generate taxes. Going back to Washington D.C. in all candor. So, if your B Corp, if your venture shows promise for commercialization, has great public benefit and that you demonstrate with your commercialization plan and what you have discovered and validate to date with your innovation or your technology, uh, there is a very strong likelihood. And, and you know, there are also supporting programs, including technology and business uh, assistance in order to enable you to succeed. The objective of the SBIR, by the way, I don't know if any of you are planning for international uh, ventures as well, which is perfectly okay and highly encouraged. But the SBIR and STTR are dedicated to the stimulation of the United States e uh, economy uh, and the generation of jobs within the U.S. and so forth. But having said that, uh, uh, especially with uh, the involvement of Alexandra and, and, and Eric Gosick and so forth, uh, we get involved in, in pursuing foreign markets as well. So I hope that so kind Jack, of answers your question. I guess Jack has a follow up. Go ahead, Jack. Unmute. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Just jump, unmute and jump in. Oh, thank you very much, both to Scott and to Martin. Um, you did answer my question. I, I recognize, first of all, I'm doing some of this software development under, an, under a nonprofit, which is obviously uh -huh. not qualified for SBIRs, but our intent is to spin out an SBIR, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a B Corp. Um, and there's a reason for going to the B Corp. And let me be explicit about that. Um, if we went with a full C Corp or any of the classic corporate structures, then we're beholden to stockholders for financial gains. Whereas our project is aimed purely at improving the way humans hold forth on conversations about matters that matter. Now that's kind of tricky, but the 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 point is is that we cannot create a financial model which forces us to to do things within the corporation which which are not healthy for for society. So we chose a B Corp. Uh, it's good to know that it's possible to do that. Here's the issue. Um, the topic of social networking is not something you find in common. You'll, you'll see occasional NSF grants in that space, but I'm much more interested in exploring the broader, the broader space. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there, are, there are organizations that do, um, for example, the intelligence organizations could use improved internal social sense making conversational platforms so there there may be dod funding there may be others that was that was the net essence of my question thank you okay I, I i think i heard and maybe it was incorrectly jack um that that your b corp venture is not uh, benefiting or not for the purpose of benefiting society, that it is something else? No, it, it is strictly a benefit corporation with a declared public benefit, which ah, okay. technically speaking is to improve the way humans collaborate on monster uh, conversational uh, issues. 
I mean, we, we all acknowledge that it's very difficult to hold a, a serious conversation online without being called a jerk or something else. Uh, we're creating an ecosystem that essentially takes conversations inside of the game atmosphere. Uh, Jane McConigal did that for IFTF. Uh, we've we've taken her work a step further. That's uh -huh. the, the, I can answer questions otherwise, but thank you. Sure. Jack, thanks so much for that question. That was uh, that was great. Uh, do we have uh, any other raised hands at this particular moment? Otherwise, I will I will toss out a question to some. Yeah, of our we analysts. we've got from I'm not sure if I'm pronounced correctly, but um, Elmira Elmira uh, asked. Had, I guess um, has a uh, novel study using a natural protein for treatment of celiac disease, and I was uh, so I guess the question is I'm not sure if he or she is looking for SBIR STTR funding help or has a specific question, but. Um, they asked if uh, we can uh, help a life science startup, which as we, of course we can, I don't know if uh, you want to weigh in on that, anybody else, but obviously we can help life science startups. But again, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, we help from, you know, startups that are in the lab all the way, as we talked about, to startups that are ready to raise uh, angel and venture capital. So I'm not, maybe if you have a specific question around applying for um, either SBIR funding or, or angel or venture capital, we can answer that. You can put it in the chat or you can unmute. And while you're doing that, Martin, do you want to throw out another uh, question or? or well, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just want to make certain that, that we're clear on responding to that. We are yeah. extremely heavily involved in life science ventures, including what you had just mentioned. Uh, we have built relationships with all 22 or so of the sub -en entities of the National Institutes of Health. We know the program officers and they most certainly know us as well. So uh, there is no shortage of our involvement in life science ventures for various diseases and other indications. So Paul asks, how much IP information do you need to disclose for NSF SBIR phase one? For example, in the project pitch, how do you satisfy the technical challenges section, which requires answers on how to resolve the high risk challenges without disclosing IP? That's a great question. Okay, so we encourage you to not disclose IP. And in fact, uh, it is a standing agreement and understanding of all of the agencies and the reviewers uh, is that it is not shared that information beyond the small community that is reviewing and evaluating your proposal. That being noted, if you feel uh, that you do need to include some information in your proposal that is proprietary, uh, you, you must and should highlight that information with specific instructions that uh, that proprietary information should not go beyond the eyes of the reviewers. So you need to be very specific about that. Also, if you have not already at a bare minimum uh, have your provisional application uh, applied for or submitted to the USPTO, if not further. Does that answer the question or, or, or not? I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all, all I'm suggesting is that it is the, the, the purpose of an SBIR or an STTR research application is to not disclose proprietary, proprietary information. The purpose is to get funded to conduct proof of concept feasibility and later on in phase two efficacy. So these are study research proposals. It is not intended for you to disclose whatsoever any proprietary information. That being noted as part of your research, you may be by default providing information that you would prefer not to be shared. So we will work with you to make, make certain that that is communicated to the reviewer community or the study section that will be uh, considering your proposal. And uh, I, I, for some reason, I didn't see um, Elmira or Elmira's hand raised. So do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question or, or, or give us more details? So I, I don't know why I'm not seeing the, uh, the hands go up. I, but anyway, uh, go ahead and unmute. Um, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. You can correct me when you unmute. El Elmira, you want to unmute? Don't be shy. <laughs> well, while 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 um, 
I, I don't want to say he or she, I'm not sure, but it, it, while she is or he is doing that, um, oh, here we go. There's another message coming. Let's see. Oh, she's having oh, yeah. connection issues. Uh, so we'll wait. We'll wait. It's we'll wait. We'll wait. Jump in. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Parshuram from uh, and our friends at ATGC, um, he's uh, in our incubator at UCR, but they are based. They're a biotech company based in India. They've developed a smart controlled release pheromone extensively uh, evaluated in India. They're interested in introducing for the crops in the U.S. Uh, and develop a dossier and commercialize in the U.S. He says, for this, we need funding. We would like to have help from you for submitting the proposals. I assume he means for SBIR, STTR. I know, Steve, you've done quite a bit of work in ag tech and mm -hmm. also led teams to uh, National i -Corps. Do you want to Do you want to take that one? Do you want to unmute, Steve? Sure, happy to. And, I, and I, Martin can chime in or and others as well. Uh, I guess the question is, do you, do you have, have you established a U.S. entity? At this point, yes. because if you're if yes, you're yes, we, we have U.S. entity and uh, perfect. Yeah, and that's what uh, we, uh, we have uh, in the uh, incubator in uh, UCR. Excellent. In in the MRB building. Right. Good, because Scott and I worked with another client who, who who has a basis in India but hasn't established U.S. entity yet. So that's a key important milestone to establish. You've done that, so that's great. You've checked that box. Um, and then yeah. we you know we do a lot of ag tech and, and obviously chemistry based and ag tech and uh, equipment-based and software-based uh, client work. So, you know, certainly this is an area that's de definitely right in uh, UC Riverside's wheelhouse. The ag tech is a major initiative and we have many, many clients in that space. I, I would venture probably at least a third of our clients yes. uh, or uh, have ag tech roots and ag tech and, uh, affinities. Uh, uh, can, and you, uh, can you repeat uh, what's the uh, organization you are telling uh, in tech? No, I'm sorry, ag, ag, ag tech, meaning agricultural, agricultural, ag, agriculture. ag, agriculturally related technology. Okay, okay, okay. Go that area, and sorry, I'm using a using a, 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 a contraction here. So ag tech is a very, very key thrust for UC Riverside, given obviously that the, the university itself has a lot of technology and a lot of interest and, and, and efforts going on in that space. So on the order of, I'd say one out of roughly or so a third of our SBDC clients and even our i clients have ag tech roots and background. So it's an area that's very familiar. There's a lot of know-how, enabling know-how. There's a lot of expertise amongst the entrepreneurs and residents and mentors that can support. So I guess I would just say there's you know, a very uh, very hearty yes to that question. And then obviously we have people like Martin and others who are, have deep expertise, not only in the category, but in what the various examiners and applicant, uh, those reviewing the applications, what they look for and what their hot buttons and what their love languages are. So I think, I give an emphatic yes answer to your question. And the, okay, and, the and the primary point uh, that that Steve had mentioned here is that the crux of the SBIR and STTR um, uh, grants, since we're talking about that, is to stimulate uh, and generate the United States economy and to generate jobs in the United States and so forth. So we do have various clients who may uh, have originated in another country. It could be Chile, it could be Mexico, it could be India or, or elsewhere, but uh, we do need to form a US-based company because it's the US-based company that is applying for these non-dilutive funding grants and so forth. This is not to say that you cannot have collaborators in Chile or Mexico or India or wherever. Um, and the agencies do not have an issue with that whatsoever, as long as we're transparent. But ultimately, the objective is to stimulate the U.S. economy, at least initially. Yeah, um, that's what we are interested in. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Now, the Department of Defense has more severe and restrictive constraints on that. So it's a case by case basis. And uh, while the NIH and the NSF and other agencies may be a little bit more lenient, the DOD may be a tougher hurdle to go over. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, um, uh, so uh, Shirish has a question. Um, yep. uh, one of our MBA students at, I, I'm assuming UCR, or maybe not, but uh, an MBA student in any case, um, you have a SaaS based startup. Um, you're looking for help growing it. Um, you're a student entrepreneur. Yeah, so basically, um, I'll just answer that quickly. I'd recommend, depending on what campus you're on, um, there's a program that's called Launchpad, 
And um, the I don't know if Francis, who runs the program for us, is on this call, but basically um, uh, it's a great program for student entrepreneurs to get help uh, with their startups as they're you know attending the various universities around uh, California and beyond. It's a it's a national program. So I, if someone could put uh, Francis's contact info for me uh, in the chat uh, for Sharish, that would be great. And um, uh, Let's, uh, before we get to Nicholas's follow-up question, I just want to um, see Dave has a question asking how, oh, how you can contact us. Well, I, I put my info in the chat up above. If you just join, we can put it in again. And Martin, can you throw your email in there? Uh, sure. Dave Smith would like to ask you some questions about uh, NSF, SBIR phase ones. Absolutely. And, and, so I'll do that straight yeah. away. Cool. And then Mark Chi has a question for Bill. Yeah, for Bill. Yeah, exactly. Bill, Bill Waldo is in the food industry. What is his view on upcycle food tech, food recovered from food waste? Bill, you want to unmute and take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Unfortunately, I can't really contribute a lot to that. I was in the food industry and representing food manufacturers for obviously the sale of food to hotel, hotels and restaurants. I've not had any real experience in the, on the food waste side or the recovery side. Obviously, it, it's a it's a big issue right now. Uh, even our own uh, garbage collection, we now have a separate waste can just for products like that for recovery. So, I, I wish I could add more to that, but unfortunately, it's not an area that I've got any real knowledge on. Okay, um, to go back to it, I see Patrick's hands up. We'll get to you in a second, Patrick. Nicholas uh, in, asks in the follow up. Are there standards within the application on how to manage and protect any IP, i.e. not an ad hoc part of the process? I assume he's referring to that previous question about whether, you know, how much IP or to disclose as part of the SBIR um, application. Martin, you'd already started answering that one. Do you want to finish that one off? I was uh, t typing my email address. Oh, okay. I missed, I missed the, <laughs> okay. the last half of your question. So if I, uh, do you mind okay. repeating that question? Yeah. Uh, so he's asking, are there standards within the application? I'm assuming he means SBI or he means SBIR on how to manage and protect any IP, i.e. not an ad hoc part of the process. There are no standards uh, from the perspective of the SBIR or STTR agencies, except that, uh, again, as I indicated earlier, we're not encouraging you to disclose proprietary information. Again, if you need to, uh, be very specific. Uh, if you are uncertain about how to do that, just reach out to us, Steve, yours truly, or other, and we will guide you through that process. Okay, cool. Patrick, you wanna unmute and ask, ask your question? I, and also, I'm I'm sure waiting as you can tell in the in the chat question. So you might have already put it in chat, but go ahead and ask your question, Patrick. Sure. Hey there, I'm Patrick. I'm I'm hey, in the Patrick. car, but not driving. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I've got a question about services services such as um, I'm looking at like one called Turbo SBIR. I don't know if you're familiar with that one in particular, but it's basically like an online service where it'll help you write the proposal and help you you know fill in all the fields and then submit it. So I'm curious if if you if you'd recommend or steer away, have any opinions on services like that. Well, I certainly do have opinions, and we have <laughs> we have we have met with them um, on several occasions and have considered uh, bringing them into our fold. We've opted not to at this particular moment in time. Um, no matter how you slice it. Um, while you will get assistance in preparing your proposal, um, the content, uh, the caliber of your study approach, the quality of your commercialization plan, the team that you form, the budget that you create uh, is still human oriented. There have been some concerns in terms of the fee structure and so forth, but that's for you to discuss with the folks at uh, OmniSync or Turbo SBIR. But um, they have been around for, I don't know, three, four or so years, launched in San Diego, as you may know. And they have been embraced by the LARTA Research Institute in Los Angeles. Uh, we have several clients who have worked with them and have been happy and satisfied with them. So, yeah, what the heck? Check them out. I'll just, I mean, Martin, okay. that was a very, that was a very, um, that was a great answer. And I, I I know some of the folks there and they're great folks. But I, what I would say is that, you know, look, you know, an online tool, 
it can't take the place of, of the, the expertise that Martin and Steve and Misty and the rest of our SBIR team has built over, over decades. So I, I'm not suggesting you don't start there, but I would, I would suggest, uh, you know, definitely have uh, uh, a team with deep, deep uh, experience also potentially take a look uh, at your submission. Um, so maybe try both. I don't know. And then you could always let us know like, Hey, it, you know, that was a great solution for this piece of it, but it was also great to have, you know, more in-depth help from a team like ours or, um, but anyway, yeah, we'd like to hear your feedback. Yeah. You, uh, yeah you so um, we, we, we did do a couple of sniff test taste tests and uh, there were favorable responses, but there were also responses such that uh, they really need one-on-one -on -one deep dive mentor. That's that so-called helicopter mom comment that I think I may or may not have mentioned earlier. Um, our process is that with regard to the design and publication of your research methodology for proof of concept and feasibility, uh, this is something that we go through word for word, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth until you can't, almost can't stand the sight of us anymore. <laughs> but, but likewise is uh, with regard to, uh, uh, you know, we weren't kidding when we said we've done over 100 of these and change. Uh, we know what they're looking for. We know what criteria the reviewers are uh, basing their decisions on. We know the logic of research design and methodology, we most certainly know the logic and what wins the day with commercialization planning. And you all met, uh, by the way, Jay Gilberg, and all of us are also a uh, part of uh, Jay Gilberg's Innovar team and the i program. We know exactly what the agencies are looking for relative to customer discovery and validation and market development. So I think our offering as distinguished from OmniSync uh, Turbo SBIR is uh, deep dive personalized attention all the way to clicking the submission button. Cool. So Desmond has a question. It's a little bit long. I'll, I'll try to get through it quickly. Um, I think this one would be if, if, if Alex is still here, she might want to unmute. I think this has an international component, but Desmond asks, is SBIR a right path to look for, establish our, our own manufacturer capability locally? Um, they ship nearly 2 million integrated devices in seven to seven countries. Two of their key components are made offshore. To grow the business, we will need to have our own capability to make the key components in-house rather than supplying them from third parties who could become their competitor as well. Uh, we don't have the relative manufacturing knowledge and expertise. I guess that's really more of a manufacturing question. I don't know. Um, Alex, mean, Alex, if you yeah. wish, you can start. Yeah, maybe that. Alex and Steve I, could weigh uh, in. Well, I'll follow. I'll follow okay. up because I do have the answer to that. Okay. okay. Yeah. So yeah. I guess my thank you, Scott um, and Martin. My first uh, question here would be: Is where is your company based? Where is your company established? And uh, with the international companies that we work with, it is our goal to help them understand the market opportunity here. And once we confirm that there is a customer for their technology, then we help them actually get established here. They have to become a U.S. company to a certain extent. They have to be a U.S. entity to be able to access SBIR and STTR funding. And um, after that point, you know, a lot can be done once you're established here in the United States, not just with government grants like this one, uh, but other grants and then accessing investors here in the United States as well. So I'll pass it over to uh, someone else in the team that can provide additional details on the manufacturing side of things. But if you're an international company, you need to get established, uh, set up legally in the United States uh, so that you're at least 50 percent U.S. owned to be able to apply for uh, STR and other government grants. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So let me let me just jump in and offer some discouraging news. If if I understand your uh, your question correctly, is that the the federal agencies and the National Science Foundation uh, is quite specific about this? Is that they do not fund um, uh, and pure play engineering. They do not fund development. They do not fund incremental enhancements to the engineering or the product. They do not fund the, the generation of a manufacturing capability. Uh, these are research and development projects. So you have a hypothesis, 
you have questions that need to be answered, you have aims, you have measurable endpoints, and you have planned outcomes and so forth. But these are strictly research initiatives. So they are not for incremental advancements or the continuation of the development of your MVP or anything like that. So if I understand your question correctly, uh, soliciting funding, SBIR funding to generate manufacturing uh, is not going to fit the bill for the SBIR or STTR funding agencies. So, so, so correct me if I misinterpreted your question. But the, here's a related question somewhat, not, not on the international front, but Pankaj asks, how does SBIR funding differ among agencies in terms of ex expectations, what they're looking for during different phases? So an example would be Department of Energy versus NSF. That's, a, I, I know, a very complicated question to answer quickly, but I, I, don't, I don't know if maybe Martin or Misty or, uh, or Steve want to grab that one. Well, they're all, they're all frankly quite similar. I mean, phase one is proof of concept and feasibility. Phase two is expansion of same for, for efficacy. Uh, there are case-by-case -case interests on an agency-by-agency -agency basis. So whether it's uh, USDA or EPA or NIH or NSF, DOD, by the way, are contracts by the way, so they are quite specific in terms of what they want you to propose to address a specific, a specific need of theirs. But there are um, criteria that each of the agencies have, and I actually have a slide to that. I don't have it available right now, where I stack each of the agencies side by side uh, to uh, display what their criteria are. And it's generally the same. It's uh, what's your study approach? What's your team look like? What are the public merit, merits? What are the intellectual merits? Um, what is your uh, research design and methodology? Importantly so, and, and increasingly so with the National Science Foundation, but the NIH and the others are following in hot pursuit is the caliber of your commercialization plan. And the reason for this is because Congress is losing its sense of humor in terms of these SBIRs ending up as funding um, research that languishes in the lab. It's extremely important for them to cross the chasm, if you have heard that term, or cross the valley of death. You've probably heard of that. The objective is that you need to complete or initiate early stage research in order to move forward into ultimate uh, efficacy demonstration, and this includes uh, Jay Gilberg's involvement in customer discovery, validation, market development, and, and so forth. So they're all generally, when you get right down to it, the same. But each agency, if you get on their websites, and we can help you with that, you can find out what projects you have funded these agencies, that is to say, over the past five years, they're also going to be very specific in terms of what projects they are interested in funding in this particular uh, time period. But in terms of the criteria that they will base their decisions on, they're quite similar. Okay. Steve, you have a comment? <clears throat> oh, wait, you just muted. Just wanted to step back briefly to the earlier question because I, I may have misunderstood it too. I think that notwithstanding Alex and, and, and Martin gave great answers, I would just add on the manufacturing front that if, for example, you've been outsourcing your production and you want to establish a local manufacturing operation somewhere in the US, uh, we have a number of people on our team amongst our entrepreneurs and residents and mentors who have run operations, have managed manufacturing businesses and their related operations have expertise in sourcing. You know, Alex is extensively networked throughout South America. With related contacts, we have others in, you know, who've, been sor who've sourced in Asia and done sourcing in Mexico, as well as domestically. So if the question is, do we, can we establish an operation locally? And in turn, once we, with that in mind, is there funding available? I think that's a slightly different question, I think, than may maybe what we interpreted and answered. And if, that's, if I'm understanding that, there are a lot of resources with sourcing expertise, manufacturing expertise, related best practices that could be brought to bear to support those related efforts, again, from within the uh, UCR's Office of Technology. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Um, so uh, 
Timothy, also, by the way, I want to remind you, you know, this is, uh, we, we do have uh, Bill Waldo on this panel. And if anyone has any questions about uh, raising angel capital or, or early stage post friends and family money, it, you know, Bill is a, a great resource. So if you do have any questions about post SBIR raising capital, please put it in the chat or raise your hand. And also, I want to remind you, you've got Jim on the, on the uh, panel here, and he has extensive experience with um, connecting startups to corporate partners potentially either early customers or as as many of you know a lot of the large corporations have their own venture capital arms so if you have any questions about corporate partnerships please uh put that in the chat or raise your hand and jim can dive into those also doug as well um, uh, is an expert on uh, business development and, and and growth and also uh, does a lot of work in the cl clean tech uh, uh scene here in uh the region. And also, I just wanted to follow up on Martin's comment there. When did Congress have a sense of humor? But anyway, okay. So um, what this is from Timothy. What is the high level opinion on Web3 integration or Web2, Web3 hybrid tech in relation to investments from the panel's personal experiences? Um, and, okay, and, Scott, and Scott, after that, I wanted to follow up on your comment with regard to corporate partnerships and so forth, because it actually is a, of critical, keen interest to okay. the agencies, and I didn't want to leave that untouched. Okay, yeah, we'll get, we'll do that, definitely. Get to, yeah. Um, yeah, and also, by the way, if I, I, for some reason, I'm only seeing, I'm not always, I'm seeing some of the hands go up, and I don't know why I'm not seeing all of them, so if, if there's a hand raised and I don't see it, please, someone just let me know, but uh, to answer to answer the question from Timothy, um, so the way it works with venture capital is that um, there are hot spaces that um, basically uh, get a lot of heat in the sense that every two to three years, there's something that's hot. Uh, obviously, Web3, prior to the uh, downturn that we have had here economically in the last couple of months, which is potentially getting worse, um, Web3 was hot. I think it still is. Um, we're, we're not, we, we focus on deep tech startups. So, you know, we, we probably would want to send you to some of our friends in LA where there's a tremendous amount of Web3 uh, funding going on. But I, in general, I would just say that, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, five years ago, um, almost every pitch that you'd see had VR or AR in it. Uh, three years ago, almost every pitch that you saw had AI in it. So it's like, you know, if, if you want to, you know, I, I would just say my only advice would be it better be real because um, the the VC, if you do get to the point where you start, are, you are able to take meetings with venture capitalists, they have teams of analysts and, and experts and, and uh, folks in their network that will sniff out, you know, BS AI, BS Web3. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that Timothy, your project is that. I'm just saying, just if you are going to put Web3 in your pitch, and try to go out and raise capital with a Web three, um, you know, key, uh, you know, whatever secret sauce type pitch. Then just make sure it's real. So, and and we can follow up more offline if you want to talk more about it. And like I said, I would focus on connecting into LA because that is uh, LA and Miami are probably the two hottest uh, Web three scenes right now. But again, our team focuses more on deep tech. Um, and then Nicholas, um, just to follow up on a question, uh, Martin, before you get to the corporate, sure. mm -hmm. um, Nicholas is asking, what is the average time to draft, vet, and revet, and then submit an application? I'm assuming he means SBIR, start to finish. Where do most time delays occur? And then maybe you can also follow up with the corporate uh, answer. We have a rule of thumb. Let me just jump in. Uh, uh, if you're a newbie, if you're a rookie, a minimum of 150 hours to prepare and submit. Uh, if you work with me, it probably stretches to two hours, uh, 200 hours, not two, I wish two hours, 200 hours. Um, and it's, it's because of the way I uh, warned you earlier about being that helicopter mom and being your your, uh, you know, your biggest pest in terms of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. If you are experienced with submitting SBIR or STTR uh, 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 proposals, it could be possibly be less, but um, it's critical that sufficient time, and this includes, by the way, the generation of uh, relationships for initial customer discovery, generation of those absolutely critical required mandated letters of endorsement and so forth so there is time that is required for pollinating with 
uh, corporate partners and so forth as well. And likewise, for the formation of academic research relationships, which is also critical. Because keep in mind, these study sections are all, for the most part, academics. So we need to present as if it was a university-based basic um, basic research proposal and so forth. So that's, uh, uh, it, it does take a very long time. And so for any of you who approach me and say, hey, uh, the deadline for the NIH is next Tuesday at five o'clock, um, I can't help you, nor, nor can anybody else. And um, uh, we typically, Steve and I, others, require request at least a couple of months of working in collaboration with you to prepare a proposal that has high odds of winning. That's why Missy, for example, presented the 35% is because we're into quality, not speed. So I also wanted to flip back, um, uh, if you guys don't mind for just a couple of moments on corporate partnerships. The uh, SBIR study sections reviewer said great store by corporate partnerships. Many of you may recall that great recession, which happened 2007, 2008, 2009, um, where uh, if you asked any of us angel investors, uh, we, would, uh, we would tell you that we're, uh, we're among the smartest people around. All you have to do is just ask us and we tell you. Now, after that great recession, we all have to sneak up to the bathroom every morning to brush our teeth and wash our faces because we're looking at some of the dumbest people we've ever seen in our lives. The reviewers feel the same way, quite frankly. They don't necessarily know whether or not um, your venture is going to succeed in the commercial market. So it is absolutely required and mandated. And if you do not have those letters of support and endorsement from a corporate partner, uh, the odds of you succeeding uh, are demonstrably less. So it's extremely important. And by the way, the National Science Foundation and the NIH is following closely behind with programs called Partners for Innovation. And what that means is that they want you, encourage you to form a key alliance with a corporation that sees you as prospectively a strategic fit within their market. And if they opt to work with you, and perhaps we also have a program relative to matching funds, if they uh, see you as prospectively, not guaranteed, as, but as prospectively, if you achieve all your milestones and your deliverables, as you are proposing in your SBIR or STTR grant, there is a strong chance that they may continue to work with you with efficacy and carrying you the rest of the way into the commercial market and so forth. Very, very important to the agencies that, that if you do generate a corporate partner uh, or also an academic partner, by the way, for the conduct of research and so forth, your chances of success are greatly enhanced. So I can't underscore that enough. Yeah, and Jim, can you, um, can you just weigh in a bit on the, some of the pros and cons that you see of um, early stage startups, whether it's, it's com research coming out of the labs at the research universities or maybe even community startups uh, partnering with the some of the large corporations that you work with? Yeah, Scott, there's, you know, there's a lot of parallels uh, between SBIR, the proof of concept, and what we go through here, uh, working with industry who are interested in uh, working with our faculty researchers. Uh, and, and the point being that they're looking for that integration, that fit uh, with the need of the company and the faculty research. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, Sometimes these talks, these negotiations, the proposals uh, will take months to get to an agreement where we finally have a sponsored research agreement. And there's the, the parallel with um, SBIR and finding that corporate fit is, is the same it's the same thing. Um, I want to point out that the letters of support that uh, were mentioned by Martin uh, and the importance of those letters uh, coming from companies that are strategic to the uh, SBIR proposal, uh, these, aren't, these aren't standard letters. Uh, the letters have to be 
inclusive specific to uh, the corporate need, to the industry need. Uh, and each of those letters is in individually uh, uh, made. So in, in terms of uh, uh, putting together that uh, corporate relationship, there has to be uh, that point where the industry partner really values uh, what is going to be coming out of that research. It's going to solve uh, a corporate need. It'll uh, potentially solve an industry need as well. And if that is accomplished, um, then the uh, uh, SBIR proposal has uh, a much better chance of, of being successful. So hopefully that brings a little bit more light in terms of uh, industry's uh, outlook, uh, the, the, the outlook of the value and what they ex expect as well. Yeah, that's great, Jim. Thank you. I, I before we get to another SBIR question, I just have to say I'm I, I I've never experienced a, a Zoom uh, or any meeting with uh, this many entrepreneurs, and they don't have any questions about raising angel yeah. or venture capital. That's yeah. shocking to me. But I, I'm not I'm not trying to force any questions. But just just so you know, in case you join late, we have Bill Waldo uh, here on the on the line. He's an angel investor and uh, also one of our uh, expert mentors. But um, if, if anyone does have any angel or venture capital questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. And while you're doing that, we're gonna go to another SBIR question. The, oh, well, Steve, I guess, has a question about, or a, a question about uh, uh, SBIR, or sorry, uh, a venture. Uh, go ahead, Steve, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry, Mark, Martin talked earlier about you know the, the help we provide and the amount of time it takes. I would add though, and we might even have some anecdotal perspective here, the hit rate of applicants that work through the process, working with and through the team, Martin and others on this team, I think is meaningfully higher than just the average applicant. I don't know, Martin, if we can kind of characterize that, if not, you know, maybe anecdotally, what, what our success rate is for SBIR and related grant applications, you know, via, uh, via UCR support and enablement versus sort of the market at large. Yeah, uh, Misty shared that with us, okay. Steve, and, and, and thanks for asking. Yeah, we average, give or take a couple of points, around 35% phase one success rate. And for phase two, it's 45 to 50% and north of that. This compares to and across the board, all 12 agencies of uh, somewhere between 14 and 18%. Uh, and the reason why, um, semi tongue in cheek that we have been successful at the 35% uh, relates to the amount of attention, deep dive word for word, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, I, I tongue in cheek refer to abuse and torture and so forth. But the objective is that uh, until we are all feeling warm and fuzzy that this proposal is ready to go we beat the living daylights out of it. And we spend an inordinate amount of time, research methodology, study approach, aims, objectives, land outcomes, uh, key metrics, everything that, that is expected by the study section for a peer reviewed research project. Because even though these are this is applied research with the aim of commercialization, it is still treated to the same rigor and reproducibility as if it was a basic R01 research project. So we're at ballpark 35% on an annual basis right now, Steve. So uh, before we get to another follow-up from Nicholas, let, let's, uh, Juan has a question about how is the reauthorization process going? Is uh, Martin or Misty or, or Steve, are you in the loop on that? So I, yeah. I, I just saw an email okay, good. during this meeting that, um, positive news that they believe it is going to be um, reauthorized and um, voted on, I believe on the 28th, and they do believe it's going to pass. So yeah, that yeah, is the news is, today. <laughs> yeah, that, that is Jean Shaheen's bill. And uh, she also is one who touts uh, raising the dollar amounts for each one of the SBIR and STTR grants. So she is certainly my hero and I had the pleasure of meeting her on a couple of occasions back in Washington DC um, a, a couple of years ago so yes it does look like it's going to happen we thought there was going to be some partisan standoffish back and forth the the the, the obstacle that that it was facing 
was uh, voiced by Rand Paul uh, of Kentucky. Uh, and that has to do with uh, a, a couple of organizations, and I've known a couple of them here, even in California, where they specialize solely in receiving uh, SBIR grants as their sole source of revenue. So that was an issue that they had to tackle. There are a couple of provisions now where you have to actually have made transitions into phase two, and then ultimately with phase two IP and movement across the valley of death. And if you don't meet a certain 25% specific, uh, you are no longer eligible to apply for any more grants. But I think that the ultimate um, content in this bill that Misty says is, looks like it's going to be signed into law, I think, or maybe just passed to the, uh, the White House on the 28th, is that it will tackle those issues and we should be good to go. There was never any doubt whatsoever that it was going to be reauthorized. We just anticipated, as always the case, every six years, there's going to be partisan back and forth. No surprise right. to any of us here. Okay. Um, well, we're still waiting for our angel investor questions. I'm going to um, go back to Nicholas as another follow-up. Regarding partners for innovation, selection partner is extremely important and potentially a slippery slope. For example, competing or paradigm-breaking innovations could be tabled, suppressed. Can you speak to any examples where vetting, ident where vetting identified and averted such a situation um, no names need to be mentioned just yes and no or some context um i'm not sure if i get that one but martin hopefully you do or steve or misty on the sbir side i guess the question is i i, I i'm not sure nicholas are you talking about are you worried about the the, the government taking your ip or your idea i'm, I'm, I'm a little confused yeah you, yeah maybe you if, if you don't yeah. mind uh, yeah Nicholas, you don't, if you don't mind unmuting, maybe if you could clarify the question just a tad, we can give you a better answer, hopefully. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hey, Nick. Okay. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks. Um, the question comes from, uh, it's basically a line of sight by the Government Review Board for a, a commercial outlet eventually for the idea, right? They're, they're trying to have a T-line set up in some way. As I understand the the, the partner um, partners for innovation program when that was discussed, the, right. the, the the concern is if something is a big threat, to, future threat to something that's existing within that company. Um, I come from a, a large organization, research background with manufacturing, international company, research R and D in the chemical sphere, and new ideas can displace existing revenue streams. <laughs> And sometimes there, there, there's a challenge at the business level of managing even internal innovation within companies versus external. So the questions along the lines of that, of I, I suspect that that selection process and criteria for mutual success is very important. So, so Nicholas, I just want to make sure I'm still clear on this because I'm still not, and I apologize for that. The, you, are you talking about uh, agency decision process relative to um, the IP continuing to be successful? No, right? well, it, it's not in the government and review board. It's it's ah. the partners for innovations. It's it's with the company. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it's that company that selection process for that company. Um, is, is to not have an idea be managed, for lack of a better word, right? It's a conflict of interest, potentially, or something that needs to be vetted and identified up front. Yeah, this is where we will always recommend that we work in concert with legal counsel on that as you form a, a, a either a research or a development. And I did this twice, by the way, uh, in, in my earlier days in order to generate actually capital. Uh, from from two companies relative to two ventures that I had uh, been a, a founder or co-founder in. And you have to be really super, super selective in terms of, and it requires an inordinate amount of due diligence. Um, and, and don't be mistaken about that. I mean, you have to make uh, really intelligent decisions in terms of who and why you're going to partner with and so forth and whether or not you would be exposed to any risk. Sometimes yeah. companies want to partner with you because they just simply want to put you on the shelf, which is, which is not a good thing. So they, a, a part of your agreement is that if that occurs or if they do not perform according to desired specifications, you can take your IP back and so yeah. forth. 
and, and, and on that front, you know, it's not just a name to have on the application, right? It's, it, it would be good to have a sense of if it's a strategic platform technology that one is contributing to that they're fully intended to bring to market, right? Versus that's a great idea. Hey, by, by all means, absolutely, yeah. without question, that that's a vital component that is included in every agreement that I've ever participated in. Uh, and that is if they do not uh, pull their weight as required and as specified in the document that if they do right. not deliver to the market. And by the way, it's not just simply delivering to the market. They have to deliver to the market at a, at a uh, uh, specified rate of success and market penetration and so forth. In other words, if they do not do their job as you anticipate, there could be cause for uh, taking the IP back. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a great point. Nick, it's good to connect with you again, Nicholas. And I, I would reinforce that. You, you know, all these things are negotiable, but you obviously want to do the, do, do the usual joint NDA so you can protect your IP. But moreover, you put performance clauses, tripwires, if you will. They've got to hit certain milestones. And if they don't, as Martin just indicated, then they don't qualify to, to continue to have a licensing access to your intellectual property. So that's one avenue that's fairly commonly used, which you, you, and you'd want a lawyer involved with all that, as, as you, I'm sure you might imagine. So as you're mentioning these things, there's actual obligations and milestones mutual that need to be met in order to assess the progress and commitment level. And if they're not being met, then that's how you can pull out. Uh, that is absolutely right. Okay. Correct. All right. No, I, I, thank you. Yeah, that, that's and, part of the legal counsel right. um, requisites. I mean, Steve and I can give you legal advice and medical device and everything, but that doesn't mean that uh, you'd want to take that advice from us. So get legal counsel. Uh, and the content of that agreement needs to be very, very specific. And yeah. uh, by the way, we we have relationships with uh, right. very, very powerful and effective legal counsel here in SoCal. Uh, and if you do have an interest in in meeting with any of them, we'll be very, very happy to help you along that way. Yeah, I was going to ask I was going to ask Jay Gilbert Please. a question, but I think yeah. he he has taken off. But I'll I'll reserve that to when I see his. Him that he's returned I, back. I think it's yeah. wise for you, Nicholas, so to tread lightly there and be cautious because yeah. you know the landscape is strewn with large companies that swallow up smaller companies or you know get in these so-called business relations with them, and then they they know that they know that they can lawyer up later on and win a war yeah. of attrition. So yeah. it's very very prudent for you to be cautious there and sort of be selective about with whom you're partnering and uh, do your do your homework on who they are and are they are they a company that seems to operate uh, in, in, in an ethical fashion or do they have some 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 spotty history there, etc. Um, so that's, it's, I think it's smart to be, to proceed with caution. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. So I, I, I might've missed something in the chat. If, if I did miss your question, uh, please, you can unmute and ask it, or if you have a question you just thought of, uh, otherwise we're, we're at the, I don't have any more questions. So, uh, that are in the chat. So unless we want to add any more questions, uh, Martin, I don't, I don't know if you want to wrap early or we'll see if there's any other questions that come in here, but well, uh, I wanted to. Uh, d does anybody have any questions whatsoever with regard to uh, the, the essentials of, say, a well-prepared pitch? Are, are any of you at a stage where you are seriously looking into a pitch uh, to angel investors or perhaps even at a later stage with the VCs? Or are most of you here relative to um, non-dilutive um, non funding grants and so forth? We, we have like, brought a, a couple of super smart people here, and in particular, Bill Waldo and Scott, uh, uh, relative to conversations uh, for raising equity capital, and they can help you with anything. Does anybody have a question whatsoever relative to raising capital? Looks like, a, I think, I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. Eamon says, yes, I am. I guess that means ready to pitch. Um, and uh, Ella says, yes, need more practice. So I'm not sure, but do, do you have any questions about, um, uh, Jack says open to pitches and grants in the context of a public, yeah. So it's Jack, I think we kind of covered that. Um, I, I not don't want to be discouraging. I, I definitely think, you know, as Martin said earlier, pursue the grants, but um, I, I, I work with 60 plus um, uh, venture capital uh, groups as well as a, a whole lot of angels. And I don't know anyone that's interested in a B Corp uh, in terms of an investment. Now that, that could be just, again, there are obviously many hundreds of uh, groups. So maybe some, uh, some of the VCs or angels that are doing more social, uh, you know, type uh, 
investments, but that's the, the very, very few and far between. Uh, most VCs are, are need to make money for their LPs or their limited partners. So I, 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 uh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, so I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Amon needs a, Andreessen dropped 30 million. But yeah, that's true. I was just about to mention that actually. So yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I, I guess, I guess the, the, the VCs that I'm in contact with the angels typically aren't um, interested in B Corps, but it doesn't mean that, yeah, Andreessen obviously is one of the top VCs. So there you go. But I, I'm not connected to Andreessen. So I, I, but I'm sure others in the Southern California, uh, you know, mentor network could help you out. Um, and um, anyway, so uh, so I, I, you're, you're asking about pitch yeah. practice, uh, just to give a quick, and also, uh, by the way, Bill has to, has, has, is going to have to step out in a sec, so I can just take any uh, angel or VC questions from now on, but um, but I just would say for, for those who are saying they need more uh, practice with their pitch, it's another thing we do as part of our program is we help startups um, optimize and Get their pitches ready for uh, for for angel investors and, and venture capitalists. But we also it's it's not just about the pitch. It, you you know you really also need to understand what the angels and VCs are looking for. And I, I think we'll probably have to have a, a separate uh, session on that to go into that. But um, uh, let me just uh, we've got a bunch of flowing in here. Just hold a sec. So in the interim, Scott, I, I wanted to take advantage of Jay before you bail out on us. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm a disciple and have been uh, for a long time of everything that Jay does, Jay Gilbert. And um, the National Science Foundation and most of the other agencies, at least in, uh, in phase two, if not phase one, set great store by and make their decisions on the caliber of the commercialization plan. And importantly, uh, the NSF, at least, and others are seriously considering, and again, this comes from congressional pressure, is that they're not interested uh, in uh, 1099s, but rather W-2s, real employees, to participate in plan development and execution of the commercialization plan. And Jay, I wanted to see if maybe you could help us out. Uh, for any of you who, uh, since we're covering SBIR extensively, um, how critical uh, commercialization is, customer discovery, customer development, validation, and so forth. And maybe if you could help us just, you know, with an overview, if you don't mind, relative to uh, the sequential movement of Innovar to uh, the um, Zap and Boone program with the Western Hub to beat the odds to the national i and so forth, and how critically important it is to uh, not only winning SBIR grants, but also later on angel and venture funding. And the reason why also I bring this up, and Bill may have left us, but Bill and I and other colleagues have sit, sat in on dozens and dozens and dozens, if not more, deal reviews where uh, even though there may be uh, templates that we all follow, and there are a variety of them, that, but there are essential questions, three of them that are asked almost invariably. Number one is, what is your business model? Number two, how did that model come about? And number three is what traction have you gained with that business model? And so that brings into play, Jay, I think everything that you and your instructors and mentors do to be fully prepared to actually effectively answer those questions without a saliva bubble forming on our lower tip uh, lips. And I wondered if maybe you could walk us through ever so briefly uh, you know, starting with Innovar all the way to the National i and why it is such a big deal, even for, and especially for rather VCs. Well, yeah, Martin, you've kind of already uh, answered the question, but, uh, you know, when you're sitting uh, as a reviewer uh, for an SBIR award, you're looking at uh, the likelihood of this uh, project advancing to do what the funders wanted to do, which is to form a uh, business that's going to hire a lot of people and pay them good wages and help the American economy. And 
for many of the uh, applicants, they are coming from academia. And that's, you know, their idea of success is more research money or more uh, grad students in their lab or whatever. That's not the, uh, that's not the right answer. So simply say we're going to commercialize is meaningless in that context. So you have to have some idea of what you're going to be commercializing for and for whom and how. And that's why uh, part of the, our, our local program it, at UCR has a commercialization plan. That's part of the part of the program. And uh, I think about half of the uh, mentors and instructors uh, are here uh, as part of this program because we don't want to just help you get through uh, the uh, Innovar program. We would like to help you also get into the national i program, which has a bit more uh, teeth, a bit more money, and uh, a much deeper dive into who is your customer. Uh, and then in terms of uh, what that ultimately means is uh, when you apply for the SBIR, if you've gone through those programs, there's no question in either your mind or the reviewer's mind that you understand that identifying a customer is an essential step in the commercialization plan and you'd have made that progress. So when they read your section, it's gonna be so much better than say some other uh, applications that haven't gone through this process. So it gives you competitive advantage. It makes uh, Misty and Martin's uh, work so much easier to help you get prepared. And the people who are here today attending, I can see Steve and Eric, and uh, I'm not sure who else, but plenty of us here today. So that's what it's all about. Um, the alternate path, Martin, that you mentioned about uh, through the i hub, uh, they have a couple of classes that uh, we can send you there as well. So if you're your CR, I recommend uh, reaching out to me. I've put my email out there. Previously, I'll do it again when I'm done chatting, uh, you know, to get you through our Innovar program, get you uh, a mentor and, and as, have that be your first step. Uh, if you are a faculty member who has NSF lineage already being funded, uh, it's a quick stop through us to getting the NSF i award. If not, it might be a little more complex, but we'll still get you there. I hope that answers the question. It, it, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it does. And Jay, I just wanted to also underscore all of this. The reason why I asked this question is, is increasingly uh, in your SBIR proposal, either phase one or, or phase two, um, you may have a sterling study approach. You may have a, a kick tail feathers research team, but if you don't have a commercialization plan that has been cause for rejection. And this again comes from congressional pleasure, pressure, excuse me, uh, in order to cross that valley of death. Uh, so that's that sense of humor, Scott, that I was referencing earlier, so to speak. Not that you're, you're right. I, I don't think we've ever seen sense of humor, but that's the point. Yeah, and, and, and every budget year, including reauthorization, uh, these agencies are being required to uh, demonstrate more crossing the chasm or valley of death or however you want to. So if you do not go through these types of program uh, as discussed by Jay, uh, that also means that you may be at greater risk of not getting awarded a phase one grant. I think we so, have also had a question uh, yeah. with regard to phase one, phase two, something. Yeah, like hold that. on. Let me. I got a. Let me answer Kelvin's first because okay. it, it yeah. relates to kind of what we're talking about. Then we'll go back to um, Amon's, and then we also have uh, uh, one from Mahm Hey Mahmoud. How you doing? Um, so, uh, for Kelvin asks, what is your advice for a deep tech startup with no MVP prototype yet? I'm looking for funding to solidify my MVP but it seems like pitch competitions are very hesitant to accept a hardware company with no hardware yet. Yeah. So Kelvin, um, you, you got to build an MVP. I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry to say that, but um, you're going to have to figure out a way to build an MVP and um, the, the three ways to do it. You're not going to, it would be very unlikely that you would uh, be able to get angel or venture funding with uh, no prototype built. So I'd recommend you can obviously take all the advice here. And if, it, if there's a fit, for an SBIR or STTR grant, that could potentially help you build a prototype. Um, but uh, most probably 
what you may have to do is, um, you know, you got you to gotta assemble the team to build something, uh, go out to friends and family, uh, you know, do everything you can to try to build that prototype. Um, I agree, though, of course, as Jay said, you don't want to just build something without doing some early customer discovery and making sure you have some product market fit, because I can't tell you how many startups of the, the, the 800 plus startups we've mentored in the last number of years, um, how many of them built a product that no one wanted. And um, that's obviously not something that goes over very well with your friends and family. If you raise money and then you build a product that no one wants, and then, you know, so I highly encourage you to take the customer discovery and the early product market fit work very seriously. But again, you will be very unlikely to raise any kind of capital that is not grant funded capital from um, without an MVP or some type of uh, early traction. And we can talk more uh, another time about what deep tech funders, angels and VCs are looking for. Um, going back to, uh, to uh, Eamon's question, what about help with R&D for the product in creation? I have the case study details need help in the direction with advisory and how to roll that into development with funding support. That sounds more like an SBIR question if Steve or Martin or Misty want to take that one. So let me, yeah, so let me jump in first. If I understand your question correctly, and maybe I don't, but if you have not developed an MVP, even at its, in its most basic construction, um, Again, as I'd indicated, the agencies do not want you do not want to fund you to build the MVP. But on the other hand, for the purpose of addressing unanswered questions, to test hypotheses, to uh, deliver aims, and to do that by way of measurable endpoints, if you do need to develop the MVP in order to conduct that research, they will fund that. Hmm. Okay. Um, Mahmoud uh, has a follow-up, uh, or not a follow-up, but a question that's somewhat related, I think. So it's, um, and any can, if anyone from the uh, SBIR team could take this one, it says, if our first S if this is our first SBIR, can we apply for phase two to develop our Gen 2 product, knowing that we have our Gen 1 product developed and commercialized, which helps in validating the technology equivalent to validating our phase one? I guess the question is, can a startup skip phase one, Martin, and go directly to phase two, or, or you, Steve, or, or Misty, if you want you to. Do, you do need to demonstrate, and we need to have a conversation with the responsible program officer, that you have already performed sufficiently phase one equivalent proof of concept and feasibility. Uh, there is, as you undoubtedly know, direct to phase two grants. There's also uh, something called fast track which means you can do whatever you have not done in phase one and then uh, make that transition into phase two efficacy and get funded across the board and so forth that way. I'm not entirely the biggest fan uh, with, of direct to phase two, but what we would need to do is talk about and discuss in detail uh, the research that you have done to date, uh, the aims that you've achieve the deliverables and your key findings. And if we make a determination in concert with the program officer at the particular agency, usually this happens with the NIH predominantly, uh, then they, if, if we can get them to uh, allow us to pass their sniff test and if we, they can give us a thumbs up and say, okay, uh, we will accept that you and will encourage you to go to direct phase two, then we can do it that way. But we do need to demonstrate that the phase one so-called equivalent is of sufficient caliber to pass their sniff test. Okay. And then Jack had more of a comment. Um, he said, I once lost an SBIR grant because I didn't live, quote, I didn't live near enough to university to be able to do anything useful. That was for NIH. Obviously, you know, look, I mean, that's 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 a that's a that's a lame uh, response for someone who's put the effort into putting in a, a, a you know, an SBIR proposal. So that's obviously just some some um, 
reviewer who just is probably just a, a, a you know anyway i won't use it yeah i i i would i would yeah. very much challenge that Many yeah that's, of a, our, that's a that's a, yeah. just a stupid comment so that it has yeah. nothing to do of where you live or your background or right. anything about you know anything basically everyone can have an amazing idea anywhere right. from any background uh, any culture, whatever. So yeah, don't don't let people like that uh, discourage you as an yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah, six uh, a minimum, and and Misty, you can attest to this. A minimum of sixty five, maybe seventy five percent of our effort with you is to develop and fortify your team, even if you are located in Riverside, Orange County, San Diego, or wherever. Uh, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the researchers with whom you want to work and the ones who would also have an interest in you because it fits their research interests. Uh, we've gone out to University of Minnesota, Georgia Tech, Ohio State, University of Florida, University of Alabama, and the list goes on, MIT. Uh, and so wherever, and, and Johns Hopkins University, the list uh, it, it all depends upon who is the best qualified and is the highest caliber to win the day, uh, because it's the capability and experience of the research team. So um, I, if that ever happens to any of you, we will challenge that and support you. I find it extremely hard to believe that you need to be geographically, physically located adjacent to uh, a research university. And we, Hope, we hopefully one of the positive by yeah. I'm sorry, Martin. Hopefully no, one of the positive. Ahead, yeah. Hopefully one of the positive byproducts of the recent COVID experience is people understand virtual models and how they can work effectively yeah. in collaboration and otherwise. So now hopefully that response was that unacceptable response was several years ago pre-COVID. And, and hopefully that same person would respond differently today. Because as Scott points out, that's that's just that's an unacceptable response. We just got an acceptance from the National Science Foundation last week uh, from a business which is located here in Riverside. Uh, the research team is at the University of Kansas and at UCSD. That's yeah. a case in point. Yeah. All right. Well, I, it, I don't see any other questions. I think um, unless there are any last minute ones, we can start to wrap up um, any uh if anyone has any final thoughts from the panel, feel free to jump in, or if there are any final questions from the startups and the entrepreneurs and the researchers, uh, inventors, then um, throw it in there or raise your hand. But otherwise, I think, Martin, we can get ready to wrap up. A little bit sure. Quickly. And yeah. first of all, I wanted to thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us. I hope that we were helpful, at least in part. But I think we provided you with our contact information. Don't hesitate for a second to reach out. Um, as, as always the case, um, once we all hang up, that's when more questions pop up. So reach out to us and we'll be very happy to respond to your questions. And um, anyway, I appreciate it. I, I enjoyed it. I had fun. Great to meet some of you uh, again and great to meet uh, some hopefully new friends here. So again, hopefully we were of some help, but uh, reach out afterwards. And, and we'll be around. And then, um, and also thank you to the panel. And I see your question, Mark. Um, any insight for us regarding the executive order on advancing biotechnology? Oh, I did miss that one earlier. Yeah, okay, so Mark had a question. Any insight for us about the executive order on advancing biotechnology and biomanufacturing innovation for a sustainable, safe, and secure American bioeconomy? That's not really something I've kept up with. I know that we do have a couple of mentors who are not here today, but are very involved in biotech, genomics, and other uh, startup help. Uh, but if anyone on the panel can answer that, I, I can't. So uh, uh, anyone want to weigh in on that one? Or we might have to refer that to another mentor. Yeah, yeah, Mark, um, uh, um, if, if you're the Mark, is this Mark Bernard or somebody else? Uh, yeah, Mark yes, Bernard. Oh, oh, hey, Bernard. Mark, great. Uh, great, to see, great to see your name again. And uh, maybe you and I should just catch up. And, okay. And go over that. Yeah. Yeah. Do, Martin, do you want to put your uh, email I, in the I, chat again? I know you did before. But, but, excuse me. By yeah, the way, yeah. forgive my cough. I'm just getting over the what we think is COVID, but we're not sure. So I, uh, you know, I, I know I've been sounding a little gross and crude to you, and I apologize for that. So let no, me just fine. share. Um, 
Yeah, my oh, Mark, email address. Mark put his one email in too if you want to grab it. All right, cool. <clears throat> well, um, yeah. So, and also thanks to the panel, everybody. Um, and uh, I think we can wrap up. Misty, are you are you back, or should we just? Uh, I think we can. She said we can wrap. She had to step away for a couple minutes, and she was going to come back. But if we wrap now, we can just stop. Uh, we can just uh, everyone can just bail out, and we can uh, end the recording. So. Yeah. Again, thanks so much. You are, you know, we much, much appreciated. Yeah, we love working with all, with all <clears throat> the, the founders and uh, our, our, our excitement is helping entrepreneurs and researchers and inventors. So get in touch and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Okay. So much. Take care. Talk soon, everybody. Yeah. Be safe.